Welcome to Full Momentum and HEC RAS podcast. I am your host, Ben Carey, and joining me today, Chris Goodell. Chris, it's episode 27, but it kind of feels like episode one because it's been a very, very, very long time since you and I had a chance to to connect on this forum. So how have you been? Yeah, it has been a very long time and um, a lot has gone on in the span of about well, not quite a year since our last podcast. Um, but yeah, lots has has transpired in this last year-ish time frame between both of us, right? Things are really good for me. One of the biggest um, news items for me is I moved from Portland to Corvallis. And for those of you not familiar with the Oregon area, Corvallis is um, about an hour and a half drive south of Portland without commuting congestion. And um also the home of my Oregon State Beavers. So I've been going to a lot of, go Beavs, I've been going to a lot of sporting events. I went to every home football game this year and um, looking forward to baseball starting up. I'll probably go to some basketball games here in a little bit. Um, How about you, Ben? What's new for you? I know you've got a lot to talk about, Ben. Yeah, yeah, 2023 was a crazy year, which is part of the reason why we did not make very many appearances on on this forum uh, last year. So my wife and I uh, were fortunate enough to welcome our first baby into the family in May of last year. So uh, between the uh, approach uh, of that (laughs) event and then obviously the the fallout, it was a very busy year. Also, was super, super fortunate between uh, our employer, Kleinschmidt, and um, the state of Washington to have some pretty amazing parental leave benefits too. And so I was off work for um, a number of months uh, focusing on family and, and kiddo, which was which was awesome. Um, but as of January 2nd, uh, but my wife and I are both back to work full time, which means that I have a lot more time to talk about all the cool things that are happening in the HEC RAS software. So it was a fun year, but I'm ready to, to get down and dirty again. Well, we miss we missed you, Ben, a lot. Not just having you around, but uh, what you bring to the to the office. So uh, it's great to have you back. And um, I know though you didn't totally disconnect from Raz, and you're probably teaching the little guy a little bit about Raz Mapper <laughs> and uh, you know how to draw 2D areas and stuff. And uh, he'll be the next generation of um, high powered Raz modelers for sure. So um, how about the uh, the weather though we've had? lately and and for those of you who don't know ben is like in a wind tunnel where he lives basically <laughs> so you got the brunt of that, that yeah storm, we huh? we were supposed to record a number of weeks ago and uh there was a huge winter storm that came through uh massive winds we got down to negative four degree wind chill up here on top of the hill in camas and uh yeah a lot of a lot of craziness and then of course it's totally flipped and now we got 60 degree weather it's it's great. Feels like spring. So um, I don't know. Climate change is real. <laughs> I'm telling you, and the the atmospheric rivers, the Pineapple Express that we get here, it feels like we've had more this winter than any other winter I, that I can remember. In fact, I think we just had two of them back to back go through. Uh, I think Calif- Northern California got it worse than we did, but still, we had some rivers up really high. And you know, you and I, as hydraulic engineers, river engineers. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's always fun to get out and see um, rivers when they're up high because things look a lot different. And a lot of times what we're doing with Heck Raz is we're modeling flood events or high water events. And so anytime you can get out there and see things um, happening that you don't normally get to see, it, it gives you new perspective on how water moves around structures and things like that. So, yeah, with the wild weather brings some, you know, opportunities to learn a little bit more for us. Yeah, I love that. So we got some uh, really exciting technical stuff to talk about today, Chris. Um, but before we got get there, I did want to take a step back because um, like we mentioned, even though it is episode 27, it feels like episode one in a lot of ways. And we thought this kind of restart of the podcast would be a great time to reflect on how we got here um, and, and then also give listeners a kind of a, a peek behind the curtain about what's coming this year for the podcast and, and moving forward. It's really interesting. I was on LinkedIn the other day and saw three or four different technical engineering focused podcasts that had ads on LinkedIn that were that were being advertised. Um, the Army Corps of Engineers has a new 
uh, podcast, which is which is really cool. But uh, I it is cool to think that um, we were certainly not the first technical engineering podcast out there. But I do feel like between when we started this in 2020 and now, you know, the area of kind of podcasting around your professional career and technical topics has really exploded. And so it's it's cool to see that we were part of kind of that initial wave of of content creators around the engineering world. And that's just been cool to see. And I'm excited to see um, you know, what other things people come up with to to talk about on a, on a podcast forum. Yeah, it's been it's been really inspiring to see that. And um it's kind of encouraging Ben and I to uh up our game a little bit and do this more regularly and uh, provide a little bit more professionalism to the proceedings here, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So as we look forward to 2024, um, Chris and I are going to try to do this more regularly. I know in the past it's been a little bit sporadic. Um, we have some great content up there, which people continue to enjoy, which is awesome, but we would like to have a little bit more consistency. And part of the reason for that is we'd like to kind of shift gears from solely talking about individual RAS topics to having a little bit more interaction with those who follow the podcast, follow us on LinkedIn. Um, and so we are going to start the process of soliciting uh, questions from folks that that follow the podcast um, that you know maybe we can answer on on this forum, uh, as well as interacting and asking some questions of, of you all, because the reality is, is there's a lot of users out there that know a lot about RAS or have different experiences with different RAS features that we don't have. And so if there's a way that we can kind of farm those out from others and then share that with the larger audience here, we'd like to start doing that as well. So uh, in, in 24, definitely follow both Chris and I, as well as Klein Schmidt on LinkedIn. There'll be a lot more engagement opportunities for uh, HECRAS users, and we're excited to see kind of how that changes the dynamic of the show. Yeah, and I think we would be remiss in not uh, mentioning our um, invisible partner in crime, Jill, who um, is going to be doing a lot of stuff in the background for us. She's our uh, marketing ace here at Klein Schmidt. We, we just have an amazing marketing team in general, but uh, Jill's going to be helping us out, and she's got an expertise in digital content creation. So uh, this is going to be super helpful and awesome to have her much more involved with us going forward. Yep. Great. So in the spirit of that, uh, again, keep an eye out. The goal is to publish these podcasts the third Thursday of every month. So that's going to be kind of our target date. So keep an eye out for the releases around those days. And uh, to kick off our kind of desire to, to interact more with listeners, we have a couple questions that we'd love for you all to respond, either comment on the video on the LinkedIn page or on the YouTube page, with them, whichever you are more connected with. So the questions are, is who are you? How did you learn about Full Momentum? Uh, how long have you been using RAS? And what do you like about the show? Um, we'd also be interested in, you know, what if you had control over the show and the topics that we discussed or the or the kind of layout of the show, what would you do? Do you have any ideas that we can utilize to potentially improve the show? We'd love to get that sort of feedback to understand our listener base a little bit. And uh, again, hopefully customize the show and make it a little bit more professional. Anything else yeah. to add, Chris? No, I think you hit all the high points. Um, just looking forward to this. This is going to be a lot of fun. Sweet. Well, uh, before we dive into a few more announcements and then our technical topic for today, I did want to just uh, give a quick shout out and thanks to our sponsor. Um, we're thankful to be sponsored by our engineering firm, Kleinschmidt Associates, who is known throughout the industry as a firm that provides practical solutions to complex problems affecting energy, water, and the environment. You can learn more at kleinschmidtgroup.com. Would encourage you guys to go check out the website. Also, some really cool um, announcements that will be posted on that website uh, coming out here shortly, mostly tied to training opportunities around HEC RAS. So we have a number of training opportunities that we're going to be putting on this year. We're actually in the midst of doing a training as we speak. Um, that's going to be, that's kind of our, our winter 2024 course so that's a six week online course 1d 2d uh, we also just um, finalized an in-person class which we're going to hold in atlanta georgia on september 10th 11th and 12th so that'll be a three-day more traditional immersive 1d 2d class the location for that's tbd but it's going to be in atlanta more details to come on that 
And then if you can't make it to Atlanta, but you still want to take a training course through us, uh, the next online opportunity is going to be um, from October 9th through November 13th. Um, and that's going to be again that six week course where we have four hour lecture lecture sessions every Wednesday with workshops in between. So some really cool opportunities coming up, Chris, for people to yeah. continue to learn more about 1D, 2D RAS modeling. Yeah, you guys should check it out. It's we have a lot of fun with these classes. Um, it's really interactive. There's a lot of back and forth. It's not just Ben and me um lecturing at everybody it's uh i mean there's some of that of course yeah. <laughs> we got to get the content out but um it is a lot of interaction and a lot of q a going on and um yeah it's a good time we have a really good time and uh you know occasionally we have some giveaways too some uh, fabulous prizes i also want to mention too for this, uh the new beginners out there to HECRAS, brand new to HECRAS, if you're looking for an introductory course uh, I have a regular offering that I give through the University of Wisconsin. So if you just go to their website, um, just Google University of Wisconsin Professional Education and then search on HECRAS, you'll find it. We do two online per year and one in person. Uh, the next in person's in the July and the next online. We've got one that uh, by the time this podcast comes out, it's already started, but um, the next uh, online will be in the fall. So um, check that out if you are a new beginner to Raz. Awesome. And then a few other things um, aside from the training opportunities that are going to be offered. Chris and I are going to be at some conferences coming up here in the near future. And so we wanted to let everybody know who may be at the conference to come say hi. Uh, so Chris, along with a few of other coworkers from Kleinschmidt, are going to be at USSD in Seattle um, mm -hmm. from April 22nd to the 26th. Chris, anything in particular to share about USSD and what you're going to be doing there? <clears throat> so we'll have an exhibit there. It's um, always a good conference, I think. I like to go every year. Um, as you know, those of you know, USSD is United States Society on Dams, so it's all about dams. And in particular, we go there for looking at uh, and presenting on ways that you can use HECRAS around dams, whether it's a dam break study or doing some reservoir operations um you know any or all of the above um and uh, it's always fun to see uh, colleagues there that sometimes i just see once a year but um come on by say hi i know our, our buddies eric and priya from east bay mud are going to be there so that'll be fun to see them um so yeah come by and say hi awesome and then uh myself will be at uh asf the AS asfpn national conference in salt lake city um, that's going to be from June 23rd to June, June 27th, um, and I will be presenting there with a coworker uh, on a project that we've been working on really since I came over to Clenchman in 2019, uh, Sylvie's River Basin Project. Uh, it's a really cool project that involves some pretty cool RAS modeling as well. So if you have a chance to attend the conference, uh, check out the session while I'll be presenting and Come by and say hi. I'd love to meet some folks in person. We we won't be hosting the vodcast live at ASNPM this year. We had a great experience of that a couple of years ago, um, but maybe in upcoming years we'll do something similar to that. Yeah. Sweet. Cool. Shall shall we jump into the technical topic for today, Chris? I got a trivia question for you first, though. Okay. I'm going to see if I can stump you. You probably will. And <laughs> <laughs> don't feel bad because this is a this is a very new feature in RAS that not a whole lot of people know about or even understand. But I want to ask you, it's a two-part trivia question. What does LIA stand for, as in the equation solver, LIA, or the equation set for 2D modeling? And why would you use it? I can't. I'm, I'm 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 so tempted to pull up the computational settings right now, but that would be cheating. Uh, does that is the I something to do with like inertia? Yep, you got it. Um, limited inertia application. That's my guess. Very close. Very close. <laughs> I mean, it, it, that kind of actually. That kind of actually rings true. That I mean, that could actually work as the name. Okay. Um, that very. I look at it as very limited application, but um, it, it stands for local inertia approximation. Okay. And yeah. so this is this is kind of like if you think of the uh, 
the full um, ELM Eulerian Lagrangian um, momentum equation that has both uh, acceleration terms included, local mm -hmm. and convective. Mm. The LIA keeps the um, the local, thus the name local, mm -hmm. and gets rid of the convective. And so it's, uh, as, as you might expect, if it's getting rid of convective acceleration, then uh, you wouldn't want to have you won't want to apply it to a reach that changes a lot, changes shape a lot. You know, yeah. the extreme example would be a canal would be perfect for LIA, a canal with a, you know, um, significant hydrograph. Um, that's where local acceleration comes from is from your hydrographs. Um, convective is from the shape of your reach and contraction and expansion. So, but it's i think i look at it as kind of a stepping stone between diffusion wave and the full swe elm or em methods so very cool oh good i almost got yeah. there i didn't completely embarrass myself <laughs> <laughs> it is it's a new feature I, I don't think a lot of people know about it yet um it's not well documented okay well let's yeah. go ahead and transition from that to our topic for today which we're calling the hidden secrets of RAS Mapper. So RAS Mapper, uh, Chris, I'll let you give a little bit more background on maybe the history of RAS Mapper here in a second. Yeah. But RAS Mapper is um, kind of the GIS interface within the RAS software, which has become more and more usable, more and more um, insightful in terms of reviewing results. And uh, it's one of those pieces of the software that every single version that comes out, there's there's new things to do. Um, some of them are pretty cool and are pretty functional right now. Some of them look as though maybe they're getting put into place to help with future version releases and aren't necessarily helpful at the moment. But regardless, it's it's a really cool area right now for hydraulic modelers to get more familiar with, continue to kind of try things out and and you know, look at the different options and tools, because like I said, there's there's a lot of really helpful things and we're going to go through some of those today. So you want to talk yeah. a little bit more about anything else related to, to RAS Mapper, Chris? Yeah, well, RAS Mapper um, actually came out in a version before we had 2D. Uh, there was a, uh, a very limited kind of um, basic version of of the RAS Mapper today. And that was in one of the, I believe, one of the one of the four point versions, and um, that was really just as a kind of a transition to get away from using GeoRAS, which was the geospatial um, way of doing things in RAS in the past, and having something built in. Um, but it wasn't really until 2D came out that RAS Mapper really took off in its capability. And, and in fact, it's, it is, um, critical if you're doing 2D modeling, you can't not use RAS Mapper, um, because it's required for pre-processing 2D areas. Um, what's interesting about RAS Mapper is, um, a lot of you have recognized this, that it operates a little bit differently than the geometry window, although it does a lot of similar things. There's a lot of crossover between the two. Eventually, as I'm told, um, RAS Mapper and the geometry window will kind of combine into one thing in a future version. And so you won't have to bounce back and forth and everything will be done in just one GIS utility. Um, my guess is it'll probably look much more like RAS Mapper than it will look like the old geometry window. But uh, uh, that's to be determined when that comes out in some future date. But um, yeah, it's a little history and, and future of RAS Mapper. But now with RAS Mapper, you can do all sorts of things, both pre on the pre-processing side and the post-processing slash mapping side of things. But one of the one thing that Ben and I recognize or realize when we go around teaching these classes is there are a lot of features in here, a lot of hidden features that people don't know about. And there's, I guarantee you, there are things I don't know about inside yeah. of RAS Mapper right now. And I, almost every class, I learn something new from a student who points something out and I go, wow, I didn't even know that was there. That's super cool. S thus the episode today, Ben and I want to share with you some of the hidden secrets we know, but we also want to get your feedback. You know, what are your favorite hidden secrets discovered in RAS Mapper? that maybe no one else knows about or few people know about maybe ben and i don't know about 
Uh, think of this as kind of a crowdsourcing thing to share this kind of knowledge with all the RAS users out there. So, yeah, what's, let's let's get into it, Ben. What's what are some secrets that yeah. we want to reveal to folks out there? Yeah. So before we get going, I do want to just point out if you're not familiar with RAS Mapper, Chris and I did a vodcast episode on RAS Mapper, and that vodcast episode is a little bit more focused on what the different menus are, how to navigate, kind of the basics of RAS Mapper. So if you're interested yeah. in that sort of a topic, go back into the history of the vodcast. And um, I believe it's episode two or three that we did that. It's one of our more popular episodes and check that out. But this is going to be more of a rapid fire bouncing around to all kinds of cool and hidden secrets within the software. And the first one here is um, one, Chris, that you and I use quite often, and that is the update legend with view. So I'll let you kind of carry the conversation on that. Yeah, so um, Raz has a default way of setting the scaling or the legend that you see on the bottom right there for whatever you're looking at. It could be a terrain, it could be a water surface elevation map, a depth map. And as you zoom in and out, that scaling stays the same. It's basically looking at your entire modeling domain and trying to bracket the maximum and minimum values. But when you zoom in to one close in area, that range could get much smaller. And as you zoom in now, now look, everything's yellow. So we can't really see variation here. Now the hill shade helps a little bit there, but if you were to change to update legend with view, then as you change the view extents, RAS will reevaluate what the min and max values are within the view extent and update the legend accordingly. So you get the most optimized version of the, um, the range in your legend as possible. And so there's the, the button right there that Ben's pointing at, update legend with view. You check that box. It's all you have to do. It's really easy then come back out and now watch as you zoom in instead of just being all green and yellows now you get the full range of colors there so you can get a much better uh, interpretation of the change in terrain in this case looking at our terrain map but um, you can do this on water surface elevation and, and that's a really good one because you can imagine if you've got a really big long spatially uh, a spatial domain you go in and zoom into one part of your river, you're not gonna see any difference in color in your water surface elevation. But if you check that box, update legend with view, as you zoom in, you're gonna see the color variation. Yeah, so we're showing right now the velocity output map. And again, what Chris is saying is, as you zoom in, you're just not getting that color differentiation. Yeah. And for some models that have, you know, relatively small extents, it's probably not a problem. But for larger models where you can have a real variation in velocity, water surface elevation, depth across your modeling domain, it's really important to turn on this update legend with view. And again, you can get to that by right clicking on any layer, clicking on layer properties, and then clicking on this update legend with view. And again, that gives you the opportunity as you zoom in, you're going to have those color ramps kind of automatically adjust. It gives you a real good picture of where, in this case, the velocity is highest. Um, even if you can see the scale down here. The velocities aren't that high at all in this area. They're only about half a meter per second, but you can still figure out where kind of the centroid of, of flow is, and it can be really helpful for drawing additional layers, pulling output value, all kinds of good stuff. Next up, we have render mode. So yeah. uh, render mode, and I guess <laughs> I guess we got a little bit off off uh, off schedule here. So Chris, I will also let you introduce the idea of render mode. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. So um, render mode is is a way for Raz to take the computed results and make it look a little bit more realistic. Now, just to give you some background, when Raz computes a water surface elevation um, in your modeling domain, it computes one water surface elevation per cell. So within the entire cell, you only have a single water surface elevation calculated at any given time step. Now, when you've got rather steep terrain or rather large cells, you can get a stair stepping effect, or even in map view, you can get what I call fragmentation. Okay. And if, if you're looking at the true horizontal results, but what RAS does to make it look a little bit more realistic is it applies some uh, rendering techniques to give a little bit of slope to the final results so it looks more realistic. And there's different ways you can do this. The, the actual default in the current version is the top 
method, the sloping with cell corners. There's another second version, sloping with cell corners and face centers, where it gets a little bit more detailed. And honestly, I can't tell you the guts of how this works, but the way I do it is if something looks a little bit off, I'll try one of the other rendering modes to see if it looks a little bit better. But a lot of times I'll come in and if, if I really wanna see what Raz is computing, to interpret results better, to understand maybe why I'm getting an error or an instability, then I'll switch to horizontal like that. And that way you'll see um, the uh, the water level is the same in a given cell, all the way around that cell. So if you were to turn on a water surface elevation map, we can really demonstrate the differences here. So right now we're in horizontal mode, right? And if Ben moves his cursor around inside one cell, you can see it doesn't change inside that cell. Now, if you change the render mode to sloping, and you move it around, you'll see some changes. You can see the numbers are changing a little bit within the cell. Now, there's not a whole lot of change here. It's pretty slow moving water, but you would see it, definitely see it back in the river um, where you've got a, a, a pretty good gradient going down. Now, I know there's a lot of people listening right now going, Hey, this isn't a hidden secret. I know about render mode. And I know it's th this one is kind of well known, but there are some people who still get surprised by this and maybe don't understand what the differences in, in rendering modes are. So we, we wanted to bring this one out, even though it's not, I wouldn't consider this necessarily a hidden secret, but maybe not as well known as it should be. Yeah. Good. All right. The next hidden secret, which I'm going to drive, is around a newer feature, which is the ability to plot, plot a contour of a particular map based on where your cursor is at. And this is usable and I think um, helpful for looking at terrain maps as well as depth maps and velocity maps potentially. So let me show you an example here. So if you have a terrain, um, and maybe you're trying to, you can see that this portion of the train is a little bit elevated. Maybe you're trying to get an idea of generally um, kind of what contour is associated with a particular elevation on this terrain map. What you can do is right click on that terrain layer, come to the image display properties, which is where our update legend with view is also at. And you can turn on this plot contour at cursor, which is an additional option. So if you turn that on, go ahead and minimize this a little bit what you're going to see is that as i drag my mouse around the map it's going to contour to the value that is associated with this elevation in this case so right now my cursor is highlighted over elevation 284.22 so it's going to contour that live around the entire modeling domain so it's going to show you everywhere that that kind of 284.22 contour exists and this is pretty cool um, again to kind of just help diagnose similar areas of elevation you can do something similar in the channel if you wanted to see you know which portions of your channel are below a certain threshold you can see kind of the deepest parts of the channel and then obviously as you move up stream that contour is going to extend upwards in the same light you can do something very similar with the velocity map so i'm going to come on uh, to the velocity i'm going to zoom into our little restoration site here which is one of our workshops that chris and i use and if you right click again on layer properties, turn on that contour at cursor, you're gonna be able to hover over any velocity within your output. And it's gonna contour in this case, a velocity of 0 0.05 meters per second. If I get more, more into the hotspots, it's gonna contour at that kind of 0.2 meter per second threshold. This is really nice for evaluating habitat suitability criteria for, for fishery engineering. If you're looking at different suitable depths or velocities, kind of just being able to move your mouse around the map and see where those similar velocity contours or depth contours exists is, is a pretty cool kind of helpful quick evaluation tool, which is something that we love about RAS Mapper. That is super cool. And and by, by the way, this is new for me, Ben, <laughs> sharing that. Now, hey, while, while you're doing this, this is a really cool thing that I just noticed. If you look at the interface 2D to 1D on the yeah. downstream end, Look at the disconnect you have there, right? This could highlight some potential problems. And by mm. turning this contours on, you can see, you know, ideally you would want those to be kind of inline connected yeah. and not have a little discontinuity there. So that's a, can maybe 
potentially pinpoint some possible errors you might get. Now that one looks a lot better, right? Yeah, upstream end looks a lot better. And that is interesting because Chris, as you and I know from this workshop, the instabilities are at the downstream end. So mm -hmm. we we knew that already, but That's right. um, yep. this kind of is a cool tool <laughs> for evaluating that. So I love those little things in RASMapper that just make results a little bit more helpful, a little bit more tangible for users that, to, to look at. That one is super cool, Ben. I, I did not know about that feature and I'm definitely gonna use that. That is really <laughs> cool. Very good. All right. Next up, Chris, I'm going to let you talk a little bit about large woody debris terrain. OK, so this is yeah, this is a new feature that was added in. So we've had modifications, terrain modifications available to us for a while. And these are uh, just ways that you could stamp some uh, changes onto your terrain, whether you want to like raise it up to simulate a, a building or some other feature that's not captured in the terrain or, or maybe you want to cut in to simulate a um, maybe a, an alternative channel or something that you want to put in your design. Um, and there's also a bunch of pre-programmed shapes. A lot of them are similar to the shapes you see at piers, you know, bridge piers, like elongated and circular and um, uh, ellipsoid or, or things like that. But a new one was added to kind of uh, fulfill the, the requests of restoration modelers river restoration modelers. Restoration modelers like to put a lot of wood in the river. They like to put trees and root wads, things like that. And so the, there was a, a need to have a new shape. And so ATC put in the shape of a tree and they called it large woody debris. So if you go down there to your modifications yep. sub layer, yep, and just right click on that, you can go to add modification shapes and you'll see large woody debris. And when you click on that, give it a name, and then you can just literally stamp it in there anywhere. You can see the trees already there. It's got, it's a pretty basic shape. It just has two rectangles, one representing the trunk of the tree and one representing the root ball of the tree. And then you have control over the size of everything. And then if you click okay here. Let me get a uh, better elevation read on this. So this is, 287 roughly yeah so add this and make this elevation uh say 289 yeah or probably more realistic is you would add to the terrain in this case because if you want to put a bunch of these around oh, sure. you're just yeah, going to be yeah. you're going to be adding it to the terrain right sitting it on there and so maybe give it a um uh, yeah i think it just stamps it on yeah. there based on the the size and click yeah. okay you can also change it looks like the triangular the shape of the trunk which is kind of cool yep and then you can just start stamping them wherever you want to put it and you just click ok every time and then you can you can rotate it here graphically or in the dialogue window that pops up too you click on it yeah just rotate it around so yeah make a little uh, log jam there yeah and now kinda if we cool. hover over our terrain value you can see the turn contour acting you can see our elevation in the channel is 283 except for when we get on this log and then it's up to that higher elevation um, yeah based on the size of the log so pretty cool way um, another way to represent large woody debris is you know with these tree shapes is a, is a good good idea you can also do a cluster of individual pilings that's another way you can do that so you could right click on modifications add a shape circle we'll call this wood and then you could for instance add this in the middle of the channel now you can you can slap those in between the trees too oh yeah good idea you just pop a bunch of those in and you can see you can just add them really really quickly now obviously the challenge with putting in shapes that are this small even though this might be realistic, is you're going to have to have cell sizes that are small enough to pick up the differences yeah. in terrain. So right now, our geometry data, as you can see, is certainly not going to be discrete enough to, to pick up those different elevations from those, those wooden pilings. So yeah. if we wanted to represent this, the flow through the restoration design a little bit more accurately, we'd want to use a refinement region to pick up some of those uh some of those proposed changes so yeah really yeah. cool really cool option for sure yeah you certainly want to get cell faces on those tree trunks 
Yep. Um, and, that way Raz will see them. Yeah. And I know a lot of um, restoration users out there uh, often still will prefer or use 1D modeling as opposed to 2D modeling because of some of the scour abilities um, that 1D models still have. The great thing about this is you can make these terrain modifications and then you can use your cross sections to update your cross section shape to account for shapes such as this. And so there's a 1D way that this tool can still be used for you as a user. Yeah. Sweet. The next one up here is the render satellite image below terrain. So this is one that we always get asked. And for a long time, the answer was, sorry, there's nothing really that we can do about this. And the request was always, hey, when I toggle my aerial imagery on, it's always above my terrain. And sometimes I want to be able to have the terrain above my satellite imagery. Is there any way to do that? And for a long time, there was not. But now, with some of the newer versions, there is a quick way to do that. Uh, the way you can do that is if you right click on your satellite imagery, at the very bottom, there's an option to render this behind the terrain. If you click on that, toggle this on and off, you're going to see now that your aerial imagery is behind your terrain. Now you just need to adjust your terrain transparency, which you can right click based on the view options, make it a little bit more transparent. And now, again, you can see that aerial imagery underneath your terrain data. Um, so you have some options. You can do the same thing, obviously, by keeping your terrain data um, untransparent and then adjusting the transparency of your satellite imagery. But this is an option if you uh, if you want that. Yeah, that question comes up a lot. Yep. People want to have this feature. So and now cool. you know. Next yeah. up, we got the changing the displayed decimal places. Chris, I'll let you drive this one. Yeah, this one's pretty simple, but it's kind of buried. And the first time when I was looking for it, it took a while for me to find it. And so I figured not a lot of people may not know about this, but if you uh, move your cursor around on the screen, Ben, um, you can see that it displays your terrain to two decimal places. And most of the time that's plenty, right? Um, you don't, especially on a terrain, you probably don't need more than two decimal places. Um, maybe in SI, you might want to go to the third decimal place to get to the millimeter level. But but sometimes in water surface elevation, you want to get a little bit more precise um, or even in velocity for some reason, you might want to get more precise, um, especially if there's not a whole lot of changing going on. And so if you want to change the number of decimal places, you would just go up to tools and go to options. And then you go down to the second general tab under the global settings and you can see display output too, and you can change it to whatever you'd like. And now when Ben moves around, we'll see that to four decimal places. Now, again, not necessarily needed too often because two decimal places usually is fine, but sometimes you need to see um, change to something a little bit more precise than two decimal places. So that's how you yep. do it. Good. Nice. All right, we're getting through these. Next up, we have fix mesh feature. So this is a relatively newer feature. Um, where RAS has built in an algorithm to help you fix any cell errors that you may have in your the geometry. The red dots, right? The red dots of death. And so <laughs> what Chris and I have done here is we've created the worst possible break line orientation that you could imagine in a 2D mesh. Uh, <laughs> if you are watching, it's worth looking at your screen. This will give you anxiety if you are a RAS modeler. But it's we exactly do not endorse this setup. <laughs> <laughs> this this is not Kleinschmidt approved modeling practice, yeah, but that's right. it is a good example of how this tool can be used effectively. So if you want to use the tool to correct these mesh errors on your own, and again, if you just have a couple errors in a single location, sometimes it's going to be easier to do yourself. But if you have a very large modeling domain, um, this could be a real time saver for you. So to make these adjustments, you can right click on your 2D flow area, edit the geometry, and then right click on that same 2D flow area and click on this little try to fix all meshes. A little screwdriver. Yeah, you're going to get a dialogue that pops up. It's going to say, hey, I tried some things. And you can see we have less errors. We're not quite there yet. But the cool thing about this is you can do this process a couple different times, almost like a batch process. Yeah, and eventually what you're what you're going to see is now we're down to a little bit less, a little bit less. Now we're down to only two errors left. If we do this one more time, it should fix that. And voila, we now no longer have any cell errors in the modeling domain. So I can right click on this, 
save my edits and move forward modeling the worst brake line orientation <laughs> imagine. Now, I, I love th I love that they named it try to fix <laughs> bell errors because yeah, I mean it's it's not possible a lot of times to get them all. So and especially on the first try. So it may take several tries, but um Ben and I were messing around with this a little earlier and we had a setup where we couldn't it just wouldn't get them all like you would fix some and that would create others you'd fix those and create others so sometimes it's not going to work but a lot of times it's a really convenient way to get rid of some spot errors especially if you um you know you have manual edits to your cells and then you go regenerate your mesh and all these red dots show up again and then you don't this way you don't have to go in and manually fix each and every one of them like we used to you just hit the try fix all and no way they go you're good. Yeah. All right. Next up, Chris, why don't you talk a little bit about downloading terrain data? All right. I love, I love this feature because uh, I hate searching the internet for terrain data, for elevation data sets. Um, I mean, we all know USGS has, has a, data, um, a website where you can get uh, DEMs from, and there's other sites as well. But HEC has put in this really cool feature where it will scour the web for you. Um, obviously, it's not going to pick up every single <laughs> elevation data set that's out there, but it's going to go through the uh, the more typical sources. And it's going to look for terrain data that falls within your modeling extent. So yeah, if you click on that USGS, here we're going to look for all USGS data. And you can define how you want to search for this. Do you want to look for data that just falls within your current view or within the extents of your geometry or specify a shape file or even give lat long? Normally, we just zoom in to where we want to be and go current view. And then the data types, we're going to want to get elevation models. And then you just hit the query products. It's really easy. Click that button. And then everything that RAS is able to find shows up here. And you can evaluate, hey, is this something I'm interested in or no thanks? Like the 30 meter stuff you probably don't want for most RAS applications. But you see there's a one meter set there. Hey, that looks pretty good. And when you click on it, um, if you check that box next to it, it sh actually shows up. You can move that window to the side. It shows up the extent uh -huh. of the terrain data on your RAS mapper viewer. Yeah. So you can see those boxes, right? So there's the coverage that we have for what's uh, checked in the um, window there. Very cool. And then, yeah, I like this because it allows you to sort by cell size too. So if you have a certain cell size threshold that you want to use, this allows you to yeah. use that. It also has the link to the metadata on USGS's website, which is a good way of, of recording where that data is coming from and whatnot. Yeah, which you'll want to know for sure. And and you can also check, um, you know, if you're just not interested in 10 or 30 meters, just check um, check the one you are interested in. Yeah, for yeah. that filter. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, click OK. And then now that's not going to make a terrain for you. It's just going to download the elevation data set, the GeoTIFF, right? And so what you got to do is then go and create your terrain. But you'll see that that's already in a folder called USGS created for you. It should be in your project directory. There it is right there. Yeah. Oops. And I didn't actually download it because I didn't download it, but it would be in. Yeah, it, but it'll be in that USGS folder, and then you can just make a terrain out of it. And if yeah. you've got multiple elevation data sets, uh, RAS will tile them all together. And make sure you use the create stitches, and that'll uh, fill in some blanks for you if you have them. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, next up is the split selected line feature. This is also uh, one that's newer, or at least newer to my knowledge. Um, for a long time, the only way that you could split a 1D reach in RASMapper was to um, cop. Well, the way I used to do it is I used to copy the line feature so there was a duplicate, and then I would adjust the length of each one so that it split it up kind of into two reaches. Um, there was also a kind of a more cumbersome way to do this in the geometry data editor, which involved drawing in uh, dummy reaches, splitting up the reach, <laughs> and then deleting yeah. them. Uh, now in RASMapper, it's much easier to do this. All you need to do is if you have any line features, it could be a cross section, it could be a river center line, you can edit that line feature, use the edit, make sure you're using the edit feature selector, and then zoom in. And anywhere along this line, if you right click, you're going to have a bunch of different options. 
You can actually invert the direction of that line. That's a quick one. You can split the selected line, and then there's also some additional geospatial uh, uh, operations. But the split selected line is really nice. If you click on this, it's going to automatically split your river reach. It's going to ask you to name the lower one as well as the upper one. And now, instead of having one single 2D reach here or 1D reach, I should say, I have two of them, um, and that can be helpful, particularly. Uh, if you take in Chris and I's class, oftentimes if we need to insert an inline 2D area, we're going to need to split up our 1D reach, delete a portion of it, and then insert a 2D area. This is a very quick way to do that within RASMapper. Yeah, I think it's about time we update that workshop. What do you think, Ben, yeah. to do it this uh, way? This is a way better way than the uh, the old school way. Well, you know, sometimes <laughs> it builds character to learn how to do things. <laughs> right. yeah. So I'm working exactly. with a senior design uh, class right now at Gonzaga University, and um, there's been a few different instances where I could have shown them the easy way, but I wanted them to build some character, so um, taught them how to do things the old school. Yeah, yeah, that's good. All right, building character. Um, what about multiple stored maps, Chris? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so occasionally you'll you'll have a project project where you've just got to create a lot of raster maps. It could be at different time intervals during your simulation. It could be you just have a ton of plans. Maybe you've got, you know, 80 plans and you've run them all. And now you got to create these um, these static maps so you can share them with somebody, export it somewhere else. You know, you could you could do one at a time. And that's what we used to have to do. Or you can come in and right click like Ben has just done. And actually, no, you would go up to tools. Um, oh, this, this works. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That That's one way. There's actually another way to do it, too, under tools, I believe. But yeah, um, create multiple maps there. Yeah. So either way brings you into this dialog window here and you just select the plans that you want to make maps for. If you hold the control key down, you can select multiple. Um, and then same thing with profiles. You can select one or multiple. Again, holding your control key down and then all the map types that you're interested in making. And then once you've got all that figured out, then you can decide on the left. I mean, obviously you're going through this process, so you, so you want to check the box that says <laughs> compute maps, right? But the one next to it, do you want to actually add that into your RAS mapper or just dump them into a folder in your project directory? And you probably, if you're doing a lot of them, you just want to put it in the folder. You don't necessarily want to clutter up your layer manager on the left. So. You click OK, and I'm going to warn you not to do this, Ben, because yeah. we'll be sitting here all <laughs> afternoon with all these different maps. Yeah, this this will take a long time if you're doing multiple, like a lot of multiple maps. So just be careful with it. Um, be ready to kind of walk away and come back a couple hours later if you've got a lot of maps you're creating. This is a great okay. way to do, do that all automatically. Let me throw you a curveball, Chris. You said that, of course, you're going to want to have this compute map dialog turned on. I don't necessarily yeah. agree with you on that. The reason for uh, that yeah, is, you're right. yeah. is if you have a situation where let's say you know you need to create inundation map inundation boundaries, which are stored maps. They're not dynamic maps, inundation boundaries are always stored maps. So let's say you need to create an inundation boundary of the maximum condition for each one of your plans, right? That's what this would look like here. Um, if you were doing that and you didn't want to sit here forever and wait for this to compute, you could actually turn this off add those maps um, to you. You probably want to add them to RAS Mapper so that they showed up. Then what you could do is you could come into your plan data. And before you run your unsteady flow plan, you could turn on your floodplain mapping. Yeah. What this does is it updates, it computes any stored map associated with this plan. So what this means is that you could set up, a, you know, maybe you run multiple plans. You set up each of these to run, you have floodplain mapping turned on each one, you run it, and then you come back the next day and not only have your plans all run, so you have updated new plans, but you come into RAS Mapper and those maps that you added are all going to be computed. So it can actually be a time saver to potentially not compute those up front, depending on you know what your objectives are. Yeah, that's that is a really good point, Ben. I'm glad you brought that up. I, I might use this for current number maps because I've sure. I've always thought current number maps should be a default map um along with depth velocity and water surface and i'll frequently go in and add them one at a time but um yeah now the downside is this th these will be stored maps meaning you're not going to have dynamic maps that you can animate they'll just be stored at whatever profile you pick yeah yeah 
All right. Cool. Uh, All right. Next up, we got import methods, import features from Shapefile. This is, will be another quick one. So for a long time, and again, many of you who are more up to date than Chris and I were uh, a couple months ago, um, I was always, or I was under the impression until not too long ago that if you wanted to bring in a shapefile, let's say a shapefile of a river center line from another GIS project, um, and you wanted to bring that in and use that for your river center line in your 1D model, you could do that, but you'd have to bring it in via uh, a feature layer. So you would come under project, add a reference layer, navigate to that shapefile, bring it in, and then it would just be kind of like a functionless reference layer that would exist in here. You could then click on that layer, copy it, and paste it into your river center line, and it would work. But that's obviously a couple extra steps. Now they have we have the ability to import a shapefile directly into any active layer. So if we want to, for instance, import a new river center line from a shapefile layer, we can right click on this. Um, we'll need to edit the geometry. Import feature from shapefile. And then we're going to navigate to where that shapefile exists. So I'm going to click on this little folder here, navigate to where I have a shapefile saved. And the cool thing about this feature is it actually plots it on this map for you so you can see exactly what you're bringing in, make sure that it's what you're expecting. Um, it'll show you exactly where that line is. And then depending on the type of feature, so in this case, this is just a river center line, you can establish different components of that line um, depending on the different attributes that are associated with the shape file itself. So for river center line, there's not a whole lot of options here. Again, you could give it a particular river name based on an attribute in the shape file, reach name. The interesting thing is if you do this for a cross section layer, because cross sections have a lot of potential attributes that you would need to fill out. And sometimes mm -hmm. that information is all contained within um, a the shape file information itself. And so I'm going to go ahead and cancel out of this, right click on cross sections import the layer from a shape file and then navigate to that same folder. And then what you're going to notice is down below, we don't have three or four different options to assign attributes. We have many, many, and these are going to be your leftover banks, your roughness values, your contraction expansion, skew, levy stationing, anything that you could really want to associate a cross section with, you have the ability to customize that. Now, many Shape files might not have any of this information, and so this wouldn't be helpful. But there are going to be some shape files out there that have all of this. For instance, there's some FEMA. So oftentimes, if you download raw FEMA data from an FIS study, those shape files are going to have all this information. So you now have the ability to import that um, and save yourself a lot of time potentially. Making RAS easier one version at a time. There you go. That's um, pretty cool. Good All right. One. Next up, Chris, you got exporting rasters from dynamic maps. Yeah. So, so it used to be if you wanted to export a raster, uh, maybe you want to send it to a, a client or another colleague, or uh, maybe you want to send it to your favorite GIS person for them to make a really nice looking map for you. Um, you would have to create a stored map of the profile that you're interested in. And then you'd have this extra stored map down in the list there. And we'll go in a folder in your project directory. Great, but there's a lot of steps to it. And then it ended, you ended up with a stored map that maybe you don't really care about or need going forward. Now in uh, the latest version of RAS, you can right click on any dynamic map, like this depth map that Ben is clicking on, and you can export a raster right from there. You don't have to create a stored map. Now it's gonna ask you, okay, um, what's the, the extent that you wish to use? It gives you the option of a buffer beyond that extent. You want to add a little bit to it, maybe 10% beyond. And then uh, I think the cell size is optional. I think it'll take yep. the um, the actual um, cell size, uh, or sorry, the terrain cell size when it creates it. Uh, but I suppose you have an option to do something different, and it'll just up or down sample that uh, accordingly. Yeah, so not only is it the time saver in terms of not having to export stored maps to get GIS raster data, this also is nice because there's many instances where you will have a large modeling domain, but you don't necessarily need the raster data for the entire modeling domain. You might only need it for a very small segment of that, maybe an area of interest or a focused area. 
What this yeah. allows you to do is it allows you to zoom into that area of interest. Maybe it's this restoration site, for instance, and I can export a raster data set just for this area. And that would be, again, based on the view extent. That's going to be a much smaller raster data set to work with, easier yeah. to move around, easier to That's send right. to a GIS person. So a lot of really cool potential benefits with this. Yeah. Great. Next up, we have the final end value map. This is a quick one, but it's something I think is worth pointing out. Um, uh, the idea here is many times when you're doing 1D, 2D inline modeling, um, one of the secrets of success Chris and I talked about is making sure that your model geometry between your 2D boundary and your 1D cross section is the same. Manny's end value falls into that um, in terms of needing to make sure that those values are, are the same or very, very similar. If not, you can end up with some instabilities at that 1D, 2D boundary. Um, so if you want to add a final end value map to any result layer, you can right click on that, um, create a result layer map, scroll down under hydraulics to final end values and then add that map. And what that will do is we turn that on. You can see that this shows all the end value for not only your 1D cross sections, but your 2D area as well. If we zoom into our 1D, 2D boundary, you can quickly see that in our 2D area, we're using 0 0.03 in the channel and 0 0.04 in the channel for the 1D cross section. So pretty similar, same with the floodplain, uh, just about a hundredth off. So this probably isn't going to be problematic, but this is a really fast way to QAQC those 1D, 2D connections um, and make sure that your geometry is not too different. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, we should be checking that every time. <laughs> Agree. Yeah. Uh, you're up next, Chris. You got create empty land cover layers. Yeah. So <clears throat> under your map layers, we have all of our classification layers available in here. We can add end values, infiltration layers, soils layers, sediment bed material layers, et cetera. And that's, this will probably continue to grow over the years with every new version that comes out. But it used to be if you wanted to create one of these new layers in RAS, you would have to bring in a already produced shapefile or um, geotiff. And yeah, just like Ben's doing here, and then bring it in and then you'll have it as a classification layer in RAS. But what if you don't have that shapefile and maybe you're not, maybe you're like me and you're not super comfortable working in ArcGIS, but you're really comfortable in RAS Mapper. Well, now you can hit that Create Empty. You don't have to do anything in this window. Just go right down to Create Empty. It's going to create a an empty classification layer, in this case for land cover. And then you can come right in RAS Mapper and just add your polygons right here inside of RAS Mapper. So <clears throat> obviously, yeah, you got to get into edit mode. And Ben will draw some polygons in, in some areas here. I was hoping I'd be able to turn on the terrain data. Oh, it's because I have this beneath. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so now if you uh, you just click some polygons to define common areas of Manny's roughness. And as soon as you you finish, you double click, it's going to prompt you for a name and the Manning's end value that goes with it. So you can build your Manning's end table as you go. Now, when you're ready to start adding more polygons, one of the things Raz is not good at is snapping features together. So what I've learned is if you overlap like Ben's doing right here, you can make use of the clip feature that we do have in Raz. So if you right click and go down to geospatial operations, there's these clipping features. And so here you would clip and discard the overlap. And now you've effectively snapped it to, to the one next to it. You can do the same thing for all of them. Now you have three polygons that are all snapped together. together. No, yep, no overlaps and no gaps. And that's what you want with your end value layer. So nice. Cool. Love that. Yeah. All right, next up we got plot 1D profiles and tables from Mapper. This is again a quick one, but something that's useful. Oftentimes I find myself going back and forth between the main RAS window to look at 1D results and RAS Mapper to look at 2D results. What I didn't realize until recently, you can right click on any result layer and you can plot result profiles, 1D profiles, as well as um, plotting the 1D output data for um, your 1D model portions of your model as well. And that's going to show up just like it would in your 1D output from the main RAS window. But now you have the ability to do that directly from RAS Map. 
So it saves you a little bit of back and forth. Yep. That's a All good right. one. Uh, next. Ne well, just down to a few more here. Uh, we got remove missing layers. Chris, I'll let you talk about this one. Yeah, so a pretty simple tool, but very effective because sometimes when you, let's say you change the name of your project or maybe you move it to a different directory. Uh, we've all done these kinds of things. And then you come into RAS Mapper and you realize, ah, I've got all of these missing layers. Like RAS doesn't know where they are because the path got screwed up or it's just changed names. And so you've got all these kind of redundant layers in here. Uh, you used to have to go right click on each one and remove them. And if you've got like 50 of them, it takes a long time to do that. It's very annoying. So now you can go under tools and just hit the option to remove missing layers. And it'll give you a little summary of what it did. In this case, we don't have any missing layers, so it didn't give us any. But if you did, it would get rid of them and clean it up really nice for you. Huge, huge time saver. Don't want to overstate that one. That one's very cool. Yeah. All right, and then the last one here is the show, the show compute messages. And this is kind of mm -hmm. similar to the idea of displaying 1D output data directly from RASMAPPER. It just saves you a step in terms of going into yeah. the plan data. So all you do here is on any result output, you can right click on the plan. Um, well, I thought it was under results. Chris, where is it actually located? It is, no, it's there. Just go down, it's about a oh, yeah. little more than halfway down. There you show, go. Compute show compute messages. messages. Yeah. And this is going to bring up those computation messages that we're all used to. You can see this one's nice and happy. No red <laughs> marks, no errors. no errors. This is a good little model run here. But just a quick way, again, we talk about the fact that RAS is moving towards RAS Mapper being kind of the sole um, creation tool, the sole space that RAS modelers live in. And all these little ads that allow you to view things that you, know, you don't have to go back to the main RAS window. You don't have to go to the geometry editor. You don't have to go to the 1D output. All of that being added into RAS Mapper is kind of the direction that things are going. So that makes sense. Yeah, and let's, you know, where this is really useful, I use this all the time, is let's say you've got some errors in your run. Now, this particular run didn't have errors, but let's say mm -hmm. you had some errors and you wanted yeah. to go in and fix them. Well, you got to know what cell they're taking place in. So you, you could come into your compute messages right here, have it off on the side, look for those errors, look for the cell that goes with the error. Then you come back here and just right click anywhere on your 2D area and uh, search on that cell. And then you can zoom in and, and kind of get an idea of what's going on there and um, hopefully fix it. So it's a great yeah. way for troubleshooting um, and, and just diagnosing the errors that you have in your model runs. Very good. And then the last yeah. one, which we're just going to tease because it was one that we started going down the path of talking about and realized that it deserves its own episode. And that is around calculated maps. So if some of you showed up today hoping that we would touch on calculated maps, apologies, but we do have a plan to have this be a standalone topic on a future episode. Calculated maps are really cool. Um, the idea there is if you don't have a map that is um, that is default, you have the ability to create your own calculated layer based on any number of different things. It can be output maps that are created within RAS. It can be your own code that you input in here. Very customizable, extremely powerful. Um, and so we're going to save this topic for a future episode, but just be aware that we're definitely excited to share more with you all about using the uh, raster calculator. Yeah, so brush up on your Visual Basic or Python skills <laughs> for the next one because uh, we're going to get into some nerd stuff. Good. <laughs> awesome. Well, Chris, that's all I had for this technical topic today. Are you uh, ready to close this out? Yeah, but as we mentioned before, I'm sure there are some other hidden secrets we don't yes. know about. Let us know. Um, paste it into the uh, LinkedIn site. Um, you'll you'll see it it's out there or comment in the in this video right in the comments we'd love to learn about it and share that with other people as well or you know if you've uh, if we uh, messed up on anything here let us know but hopefully uh, we got a lot of good information out to you that uh, is going to be really helpful sweet well, thanks everybody for joining us today uh next month we will be discussing 2d bridges um, 
we'll be doing a light introduction on 2D bridges, talking about some best practices and potential pitfalls. Now, 2D bridges are one of those features that are, are definitely on the newer side of things and definitely something that I feel like, Chris, whenever we teach our 1D, 2D RAS class, uh, we always learn something new from students about their experience using 2D bridges. So in the same light, yeah. if you have used 2D bridges in your experience within HEC RAS, let us know what you think. Was there anything that you liked that you didn't like? Were there maybe tricks that you learned um, in terms of making that process a little bit more efficient or effective? Uh, we want to learn and uh, hear more from you on, on that particular topic. And then again, next month, that's what we will plan on covering. Uh, also, make sure to... Uh, if you if you have a chance, give us some background information on you too, just to learn for us to learn more about you, the listener. Um, how'd you learn about the podcast? Um, how often do you use Raz? And what would you like to see from the show? Because ultimately, this is just Chris and I getting together once a month talking about Raz. If there's things that people are really interested in or things that people would like to see the show kind of turn into, we want to accommodate that as best as we can. So, Chris, it's great to be back. 2024 is upon us. Um, and I'm really excited to talk to you on a monthly basis about about this software. Yeah, great to be back, and I'm looking forward to it as well. So uh, we'll see you guys all uh, next month, and um, happy RAS modeling. Don't forget, if you're interested in taking our online instruction, the dates for that are going to be October 9th through November 13th. We'll have the registration for that open shortly. And then likewise, if you're more of an in-person training type of person, uh, the link for the in-person Atlanta, Georgia class from September 10th to 12th will be available um, probably by the time this podcast gets posted. So keep an eye out. We'd love to uh, have you in class um, and thank you all for joining. Once again, this is Full Momentum and HEC RAS Podcast. Until next time.